Hey folks, did you know that Card Player Poker offers free legal poker games with no deposit required where the players can win real money? The site is giving away six summer poker prize packages that include a $565 buy-in to the $1 million guaranteed live event in Las Vegas starting June 2nd, 2017, along with $500 for travel expenses. Go to poker.cardplayer.com for your chance to win. Again, that's poker.cardplayer.com for your shot to win a free poker package into a $1 million guaranteed live poker tournament this summer. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. It's that time again for Poker Stories, brought to you by card player The Poker Authority and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast yet, please go ahead and do that. You're going to want to be in the loop, especially with the WSOP coming up this summer. And while you're subscribing, why not give us five stars and leave a nice review? If you've got a review or maybe a question or a comment, feel free to send it over to PokerStories at CardPlayer.com. And you might even win a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. This episode features Jean Robert Balland, a guy you definitely remember for his table talk in the 2005 televised WSOP circuit event. Uh, you might also know him as a former cast member on Survivor. JRB has had some tournament success, narrowly missing out on two WSOP bracelets. In 2015, he took second in the 50K Poker Players Championship event. And these days, he plays in some of the biggest cash games in the world. So here it is, my conversation with Jean Robert Balland. I'm here with Jean Robert in your beautiful (laughs) high-rise here on the Strip. Uh, How you doing, Jean Robert? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Welcome to my home. (laughs) Uh, I should say our home. My my wife and I uh, put this place together over the last year. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Love it. Did you ever think you'd be settled down? Um, I wasn't sure a couple of years ago. I certainly didn't think so, but uh, very happy about it right now. Let's get go back to the beginning. Born on Long in Long Island, New York. Uh, remember anything of that about that? Well, sure. I mean, uh, I was I was I was a kid. I just it's funny you say that because just today I was looking at a picture of uh, of me just before I left uh, left New York as a four year old. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Parents from Haiti lived in mm-hmm. Taiwan. Correct. Your mother was a missionary. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got a, a, a broad sense of the world early on. What was that like? Um, you know, I'd never trade my growing up years with anyone for any kind of private school. Anything. I mean, I think uh, getting a taste for international culture and flavors and uh, having a world view and a good understanding of people's perspectives other than just what we know here at home. Mm-hmm is uh just invaluable and i hope to uh one day you know pass those values on to my kids uh, what do you remember most from that time living in uh in taiwan um well for me it, it was just a wonderful wonderful uh, upbringing i um went to what were mostly american schools but there were actually international schools over there um and uh it's all the expats from uh, america but then you know, like my first girlfriend out there was from Australia, mm-hmm. and uh, I mean, it was just it was international, but it was like an American school out there, and it really tight knit uh, foreign community, and we all played soccer together, basketball together, tennis, and uh, it, was, uh, it was loads of fun. I have to imagine you had an advantage back then with your height. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. <laughs> our high school, our high school basketball, in order to be competitive with the Chinese schools, we actually played local colleges and universities. Oh, wow. Yeah, we didn't play the high schools. <laughs> it, would have, it would not have been fair. And it was like, a, it was a great even matchup. Our high school against the uh, universities was a perfect matchup. We were always <laughs> like right there, right at the because end. Because you guys had all the size. Yeah, I mean, well, and I wasn't I wasn't even the biggest guy on my team. I was probably like second or third, yeah. Wow, okay. So I don't I don't think a lot of people realize that you went to college, got a degree, you know, you weren't just some broke living, you know, degenerate all, all this time. Oh, yeah. Um I uh uh, went to uh, as we mentioned my mom was a missionary so I actually went to Christian schools uh, growing up uh, 
and I uh, went to a Christian university when I came back to uh, California. Went to Biola University, and then I graduated from Azusa Pacific. Went over to Azusa because my mom was a professor there, so I was able to get uh, free tuition. So, you know, that was helpful. And then, you know, I got my bachelor's in marketing. And uh, well, what was the plan back then? What did you want to do? Well, um, my father was like, uh, an entrepreneur and you know I just was hoping to one day start my own business maybe do international trade like my dad did but uh, you know I knew I would just want to do marketing and be in my own business and then just fell into uh, marketing and promoting uh, nightclubs mm-hmm. you know I uh, I went to uh, the Roxbury on my 21st birthday uh, it was first time in a club in Hollywood and I was just fascinated by it. I couldn't believe, you know, just celebrities and the most beautiful people in the world just hanging out. And I was like, well, this is so cool. And um, about a month later, uh, one of the owners noticed that uh, I was rolling in there with a lot of you know, pretty girls and people that were my friends from, from school because I had the hook up on, you know, maybe being able to get them on the guest list. And he says, well, wh- you know, why don't you... Uh, why don't you go ahead and get put your own guest list here permanently at Roxbury anytime you want. We'll honor your guests and uh, we'll give you 20 drink tickets. And what do you say? Give you like $400 a week for that? <laughs> I'm like, wait, you're, you're, you're going to pay me pay to, me to, to, to bring to – yeah. I mean, I was 21 years old. This was incredible. And naturally, I became like a rock star on campus. You know, I had ins at the Roxbury, which was the hottest club in yeah. the world. <laughs> and everybody's hitting me up to get on the guest list. And all of a sudden, I went from like nobody to, uh, you know, everybody wanted my phone number and blowing me up for uh, – trying to get on the guest list of the Roxbury. But you were a personality back even then. Um, Yeah, sure, I was a personality, but, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a personality. It's another thing to have a personality with the Roxbury right behind you. And, you know, and then eventually, like, I was giving out, I I had the ability to give out a gold card to the Roxbury. Mm -hmm. You know, it it was pretty cool. Wow. Uh, Any crazy stories from those times? Oh man, there's there's probably a lot. (laughs) There's probably a lot, but uh, now I'm... uh, (laughs) Now I'm a married, uh, married, happily married man. So, uh, but uh, man, single days were were a blast. <laughs> uh, so you're working in in the club world. Uh, when did poker kind of come into the mix? Um, poker, you know, I was not drawn to poker early on. My pops had taught me how to play. We had we had one of those octagon uh, game tables, okay. poker table with a felt. So yeah. it was actually a poker table. So, you know, my dad taught me how to play stud when I was a kid, and, and I had no interest in it. And uh, uh, Parents um, weren't gamblers, I'm assuming, as missionaries? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, and, um, yeah, I actually, um, pool, I, I gambled little pool. You know, when you go in to play pool, you play $10, $10 sets or $10 games just to make it a little interesting yeah. and just having fun. And that's what I did. There was a place called the Hollywood Athletic Club in Hollywood, and I would go there four or five days a week and just hit balls and uh, had, had a blast. And a lot of people make the transition from pool to poker, and uh, I had a big score in pool. I think I won... Five thousand or six thousand dollars. I won six thousand dollars playing pool one day at Hard Times in Bellflower, and uh, you know, so I had this money burning a hole in my pocket. Yeah. And on the way back, you see Bicycle Casino, <laughs> uh, you know, Blackjack Twenty One, whatever. So I went into there. I went in there and uh, I played the uh, California version of Blackjack, which is kind of whack compared to Because you're playing against Las another Vegas. player, right? Yeah. There's like yeah. a player is a banker or yeah, something like and, that. Yeah, and if you bust, you don't necessarily bust because uh, if the other player has a worse but like if they have 25 and you have 24, you get your <laughs> money back or some crazy thing. But anyways, I went in there, had no idea how to play that, and turned 5000 into 20000 that first day I ever went to Bicycle Casino. And... Uh, and on my way out, you know, again, money burning a hole in the pocket of a up-and-coming degenerate. Um, uh, I, I see these guys playing poker. I'm like, all right, let me just go play a little poker. And they could see I'd never played before, so they tried to put me in, a, in an 8-16 uh, hold'em game or something like that. And I'm over there playing, and, you know, uh, $60 pots aren't doing it for me after yeah. the amount of action I just had earlier that evening. So I'm like, is there a bigger game? So they put me in the 60 120 game, and uh, which instantly evolved into an 80 game. <laughs> and uh, 
I remember I lost thirteen thousand dollars playing poker my first day ever playing poker at the bicycle casino. Jesus. Yep. Yep. And that was my introduction to poker. But was, there, it, was there anybody at the table that you remember? Or um, this is just the local sharks. Yeah, the local sharks, and they were like real happy to have somebody who was completely clueless. And it was actually a mixed game. It wasn't even like regular <laughs> poker. It was uh, it was like you know, stud eight or better, Omaha high low, and uh, stud no qualifier. And you know these are games that uh, you know it takes some time to figure out and learn other tricks. But yeah, but when you're playing it. You know, I felt like, okay, well, now I get it. So now the next day I'm going in there, and I think I'm better than I was. And, you know, I, I just got really drawn to it and wanted to improve. And uh, I, 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 It's interesting that you had a bad experience your first time out, and yet you go, went back for more. Oh, yeah. It wasn't just that. It was like it, it, it's a thirst for knowledge, too, and you're, you're learning about the game. Now you start... You know, you buy a book or two and you start learning about, you know, Omaha High Low Split or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I I had never played a hand in No Limit Hold'em for the first five years I've ever played cards. I was scared of the game. I just really? thought the whole idea that you could just lose your whole stack in front of you in one hand, that was like really <laughs> intimidating. And it's funny because now that's like almost the only thing I play. I, I, I love No Limit. I love Big Bet. I love No Limit. I'm terrible at Pot Limit Omaha, but... Uh, really really fascinated by it. i actually enjoy it more than anything but i just i'm just <laughs> terrible at it i i, I really that you know that's actually the my goal game this, where you got to push small edges and yeah oh now well this this year that's my goal is to try and become a at least proficient player where i can hold my own in a plo game but uh i mean <laughs> it's funny because i'm really good friends with uh andrew robel and a couple of these other guys that you know play pretty decent and they just like just don't play <laughs> any PLO, just, just don't. Just stay away. Yes. But you yeah. can't. Yeah. Now, I, I, like I said, I, I actually enjoy that game more than any game. But, uh, you know, I, I like all the games in poker. I, I started out as a mixed game player. So, you know, and even now, once in a while, even though I'm not a mixed game expert, I love going and hanging out with the boys, mixing up <laughs> with Doyle and Mike the Hat, Nick Schulman, and just go and, uh, and Phil Ivey and go, go mix it up over there in the uh, – yeah. And the Bellagio, and they, you know, oftentimes they're playing 1K, 2K, or 15, 15-3, and, you know, Gus Hansen. It, 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 to me, it's a, it's just a lot of fun playing and mixing it up with these guys because when I was up and coming in poker, you know, Bobby's room at the Bellagio, that was like the big thing, the yeah. nostalgia. Of and course. it's like, oh, man, who's in there? And you remember, you know, David Benjamin and Chow were all pumped up back then. And, yeah. You know, and it was like that was a game that you just knew you could never afford to play in. And here I am basically mixing it up with these guys and, you know, kind of holding my own. I'm not a favorite. Well, in I remember there, in the even. early days, they, they, uh, you were playing Billy, Billy's game, the deuce game. Oh, yeah. Billy Baxter, right. Yeah. And then, but then he, I remember I did an interview with you, with you I want to say 2010, where you said that you were allowed to pick a game. Oh, right. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. So I threw Badoogie in the mix and... Uh, so Billy and I actually we, we, we started this thing of no limit deuce and Badoogie, and we would we would play those games and everybody would jump in because we were fun to play with, mm-hmm. and uh, you know we I, I was quite a good Badoogie player. I'm not like great like the super experts now. You know all these games evolved. But that was a brand new game back then. Well, I mean it was well it was new to us. Exactly. I mean, and uh, I was playing it pretty well. And, uh, you know, that was a great situation because, you know, Billy is a very good no limit deuce player. I play it pretty, pretty decent. And then the, uh, the Badoogie, I think the two of us were probably favorites with most people that were jumping in. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that was actually a good thing we, we, we did. Um, man, and I was able to survive doing that for a little while. That, that, I, I kind of missed that. And Billy's, Billy's so much fun to play with, too. I hung out with him a little in L.A., but we, we haven't played cards together in a while. Uh, I want to go back to the where you first made your de- debut, uh, the Rio 2005 circuit, where you came on and had like a. It's were you conscious of the cameras? Was it was it a little bit of a performance, or was, it, was that just you at the tables at the time? Well, there's a couple things going on. First of all, you know you're a poker fan and you watch poker on TV and you see all your idols on TV making Mm -hmm. the final table and you dream and you just keep thinking, man, if I can ever 
come up with a 5K or 10K buy-in for one of these events, I'm going to make that final table. Just get me in that yeah. event, and I'm going to make that final table. And you're determined. And I feel like that might have been like my first 10K buy-in or second 10K buy-in I'd ever participated in. And, you know, obviously I made some mistakes. I got down really low and, uh, you know, built up the chips and uh, was chip leader for a while. Um, I was just – that was – truly genuine excitement yeah. enthusiasm and yeah the cameras were able to catch a lot of that but uh yeah that was uh you know what that was actually a great show that that one i remember i think i was in college uh and laughing my ass off at the whole thing i thought it was amazing yeah, yeah, and, yeah. I, and i went out the next summer to the world series so. yeah and, you know jennifer Harmon and phil ivy were both at the final table yeah i know me. it was it was a star-studded final yeah, table. yeah yeah and then uh you know and i i had it within my grasp and uh Ended up taking second, I think. Yeah, second. No, I took third. Third. Se- thir- oh, man. Third. Brutal. I have it right in front of me. $210,900. <laughs> and and 210000 obviously, is a huge score, but nothing compared to the six or 700000 first place. And, uh, <laughs> man. Yeah, I think Jennifer finished second. I think Doug Lee won it. Yeah, yeah. yeah and where he, has, is Doug and he hasn't today? stopped talking about it since. <laughs> 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 That's unfair. Um I uh, went on your website today, and I I read this quote on your bio that just makes me laugh. Um, I'm going to read it here. Jean Robert has consistently taken the most brutal beats in televised poker history. He runs so salty, he can bank on it, and so can his opponents. If there is only one card in the entire deck that will give his opponent the hand, that card always seems to show up. Jean Robert has experienced some of the worst bad beats of anyone in the business. Well, <laughs> it's funny you, you're, you're saying that in the very last poker session I played. <laughs> I love it. Which was Saturday night. I had top set versus bottom set. And how much do you love that? And One I hour. mean, I'm telling you, we're playing for a lot of money. I'm talking about like a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollar $200,000 pot. And the guy caught the one outer on the turn. And, uh,. You know, I was like, you know, your mouth's open. You, and anytime you see all the table, their mouths are open. They're like, what in the world? How does he do that? The same exact person did the same thing to me an hour and a half later. <laughs> I had top set against bottom set. I lost top full against quads twice in the same session this Saturday night and took one of the worst night be- beatings of my life. I lost a lot, a lot of money on Saturday. And, uh, you know. So are we not catching you at a good time? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I have learned to try and not have the poker winnings and losings affect my life. And when you take a big hit like I did, and that was especially brutal, Mm -hmm. two one-outers in one night is just too much for anybody to handle. Um, I would have been gone after the first. uh, (laughs) (laughs) You're a glutton for punishment. I probably should have been, but the game was pretty good. But, uh, um, uh, yeah, basically – after a loss, it takes me about half an hour, an hour to like kind of get back into my own. You know, I you don't want to cry and whine about it a little bit. And then, uh, you know, and even my wife knows, <laughs> listen, I've had a bad night. She, you know, let me mumble or whatever. And in an hour or so, I'll be fine. So an hour or so is impressive. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's actually <laughs> that, that, that is my line. An hour after the game, I'm I'm, I'm back to OK. Yeah. Uh, so those are like the biggest pots uh, that, that uh, you got that were bad beated for you yeah that well, I, well listen they're not 100 percent bad beats because the money uh a lot of the money came in after the turn so I'm, I'm 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 looking at uh, so oh, you know is more, that a bad yeah. beat? Yeah, yeah i think it's a bad yeah beat. yeah yeah, yeah. It, well, it's a, certainly a bad beat when you flop top set over bottom set it's a cooler but when, when, yeah when, yeah i guess it becomes a cooler when the quads come i don't <laughs> know what the definition of it anyways it's brutal i'll tell you that much very brutal <laughs> um let me get to it here. Uh, what is your relationship with the Aria? Um, I'm the uh, well, I'm the ambassador for poker at Aria, mm-hmm. and I also do some customer development for them. You know, bringing in players from LA, Asia, whatever to try and get yeah. their uh, help that help out with a little bit of the casino action. But uh, basically, my job is to, to develop customers that come in and. Yeah. Uh, or mostly recreational players, but a lot of the players that I'm bringing in 
play poker and they also play in the pit. So, you know, the, the, the relationship is great. Got it, got it, got it. Uh, what would you say is your biggest accomplishment in poker or your proudest achievement in poker? Hmm. Well, actually, you know, to be honest with you, my my role and my uh, I feel like my 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 being a part of developing this Aria Poker Room is uh, part of my legacy, actually, because you know, uh, and, and and it was Bill Macbeth, and he's over at Cosmo now that uh, hired me at Aria. You know, he kind of took a chance on this uh, poker player that was struggling, and he thought I had some good energy, and I was a yeah. likable guy, and he, you know, he just wanted me to come in and, uh, you know, promote his poker room, where he had this beautiful poker room, or Aria has this gorgeous poker room, and it wasn't busy back then. I mean, yeah. uh, it was kind of, like, uh, you walked in there, and you're like, wow, this place is so beautiful, comfortable chairs and everything, why isn't this busy? And you know, It felt now, like a lot of the diehards uh, at some of the other properties in town were... A little reluctant to make the switch at first. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, you create this little enthusiasm. You say, hey, you know what? Phil Helmuth's hanging out with me, uh, playing in uh, mm-hmm. in Ivy's room over here. And, you know, Jennifer Harmon's in there. Doyle's in there. And, you know, and then people are like, hey, you know what? I kind of want to be around that action. Paris Hilton came in, played with us in there. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm tweeting about it. So, I'm, you know, and social media is just getting hot at the time. And I was able to, like, you know, uh, connect with, uh, with the audience and uh, create some, some, some heat in, in the Aria Poker Room. And uh, now we're at the point where I was just talking to Sean, who's uh, running our room over there. And, uh, and he was saying, you know, we really could use another 20 tables. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we're 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 just we're slammed, and come World Series time, I mean, it's uh, it, it, it's fun. We got all we we have everything we need in there. The poker room's just killing it. Very very happy with. What it. What about the big game these days? You mentioned playing in LA, uh, Bobby's room, Aria and Ivy's room. Well, where does it settle down these days? Does it move around? The big the big mix game is is over at uh, Bellagio. Mm-hmm. You know, that's where that's that's just that that's that's where the game is. For a while, I kind of wanted it to move to Aria, but you know what? That's it, it's fine to be over there. Sometimes we do play big mix games yeah. at uh, at Aria. I mean, we we do that. You know all the time anytime you know i call up david gray doyle you know and the guys are happy to come down and play um but uh mostly the uh, the, the big games that we play at Aria are like big no limit games so yeah. uh, you, you've always been a talkative guy at the tables um what do you think of like the whole kasuf william kasuf debate whether he went over the line or not uh do you do you like the fact that players are becoming uh more robotic and and you know quiet at the tables or are, are you a bigger fan of a talkative players at the tables how do you what do you want to see in the game i i mean uh, when people are annoying it annoys me and i look at some of the things i've done on tv and in the past that, and you know to be honest with you i was probably pretty annoying a lot of times and on survivor i was probably annoying mm-hmm. quite a, quite a bit of times it's entertaining it's good TV sometimes, yeah. but, uh, you know, um, maybe because I'm a little bit older, a little more mature right now. I like to see people be gentlemen and, and respectful and not discourteous, you know. Uh, so, you know, that, I, I, I appreciate that and, and just really respect when people are gentlemen at the table. But it has to bug you when people are of the uh, no movement, hoodies, glasses, dead silence at the table. Uh, very limited motion. Yeah, trying to act all forever. stoic. Yeah, no, it, it drives me nuts, and it's not fun, and it's not fun. And, and and if there's something, if there's a message that I can get across to young people today, that you know, some people look at some of my success in the poker world, and they say, well, why is it this guy who's you know, hey, maybe people see me as pretty smart, but they don't. Nobody sees me as an exceptionally talented poker player or like the best of the best, but part, what, what, what are part of the reasons or some of the formula for my success? And it's being fun to play with. Uh, being a great poker yeah. player is being fun to play with as well. And that's a message I'd really like to get across to people because you can be the greatest poker player in the world, but if nobody can stand being around you and nobody enjoys playing with you, you know, how, how are you going to make any money? Yeah. You know, are you just going to go over there and just just want to, I don't care. Everybody can think I'm a jerk. I'll just sit over here. And, and it's not going to be fun for you either. 
I tell you what, Phil Ivey, he's a blast to play with. Mm-hmm. He is. He is a bl- Brian Rast, so much fun to play with. These guys are very good players. Billy Baxter is a very good player, but man, he's so much fun to play with, and everybody just comes to play with him in his best game because he's fun to be around, fun to play with. I'm fun to play with. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, I that, mentioned in the big games, there's not a lot of those type of players who are, you know, headphones on and all business. Um, well, I mean, I don't want to play with that that type of. that. I don't want to. That's that's not fun for me. Mm-hmm. So uh, you know, and, and and I've actually gotten to the point where I'll tell certain people, you know, especially if they're rude to the staff or rude to the dealers, you know, I I have seriously had the conversation with. Them, Listen, I really can't stand the way you talk to the dealers and everything. If you, if you're going to do that, whenever you're playing, I'm just not going to play. Yeah. And then everybody else gets annoyed at that person. Like, we're going to lose John Bear if you don't behave. <laughs> <laughs> you got some power there. Well. <laughs> Um, uh, weirdest interaction from the rail. You ever had any weird experiences from uh, from the rail there? Yeah, well, sure. You know, uh, yeah. Well, all the time you have people that come in and observe the games, and um, sometimes when they're maybe asked to, you know, give us a little space or whatever, they might react. Oh, wait, you know, like and pretend like they're they're able to ante up. I had a guy come in one day and say, listen, I got more money than everybody at this table combined. And, you know, you, you have all this song and dance. And um, I, yeah. Mo- for the most part, people come in, they observe. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's kind of fascinating watching, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars oh, being yeah, yeah. passed across the table back and forth. And then there's this attitude of, like, you know, giggling. <laughs> giggling. Like, like people are losing huge, huge yeah. pots and giggling. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was in Europe. Uh, I'm going to say six months ago, watching a game that was so big, I couldn't ante up. Like, uh, it, I mean, it was like, I think it was like a five million US buy-in. Sick. And um, I watched this guy make a call for the equivalent of three million dollar US, and when the h- cards were turned over, it was apparent that. He had misread his hand. Oh, my God. And he could not even call. It was a $3 million U.S. call on the river. He couldn't even call. This Asian guy, very, very wealthy. And the other guys at the table pointed out, like, oh, and the three of them just started giggling and laughing. Even the guy who lost Even the, pot. the guy who lost. He couldn't <laughs> believe. He was embarrassed, and it was $3 million, and he's just laughing. Three, and I, I'm looking at it. I'm just horrified. Yeah. And in fact, in a lot of the games I play in, the recreational games, if you see that, listen, that's obviously that he can't even call that. Yeah. You know, because there's not, he couldn't even beat a bluff, right? You know, we probably wouldn't even allow him to, to lose that last bet. Yeah, you because know? you want to keep him around. You no, no. Wanna... And, 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 and by the way, we do that a lot in the mixed games as well. You yeah. know, even though, even though, you know, technically once your money goes in, you know, sometimes as a courtesy, you'll be like, oh, you know what? That's not even a call. You obviously misread yeah. or misunderstood the thing. And, and we give back the last bet. There's more manners at the high stakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How much money do you need to have to not sweat a $3 million goof? Hmm. That's insane. Um, I, I, and by the way, and, and I thought about that, and it just comes out to uh, clearly he has to have at least a billion, right? Right, right. At least. I think I think if I had a hundred million dollars, I'd still be upset about three million. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's hard to giggle about three million if you have a hundred million. Yeah. So at least, yeah, I think a billion is the right number. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, be, maybe you can giggle and still be annoyed, but no, it have to be like a billion plus a few more million oh because goodness. I wouldn't want to go under the billion mark. Right. Oh boy. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're obviously a name. You were known for, for the broke living lifestyle. You put yourself out there and made yourself a target for some of the uh, the trolls. Uh, what's the worst thing you've read about yourself, or the most outlandish rumor or gossip? Ah, uh, you know. I'm pretty sure most of the worst things I've ever read about myself, I just retweeted back in the day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it it, it, it was interesting just uh, giving my haters a voice on uh, on Twitter. 
And it really felt like most of my followers were haters. But probably what it was is maybe 10 or 20% of them were haters, but they're the most vocal. They're the most vocal, yeah. And, uh, they have the most free time. <laughs> and it, it is interesting because sometimes some of these haters, whatever, or they'll come up and they'll see me at Ari and want to take a picture with me. And all of a sudden, like, you know, you find that they're actually fans. They enjoy that sense of humor yeah, yeah. and me, like, giving them a voice. I don't want to say you played the villain, but it's weird. Like, I feel like people almost want to see you broke, at, like living that lifestyle. Well, yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I think people kind of enjoyed living kind of vicariously through mm-hmm. me. You know, maybe they're stuck at home, <laughs> the wife and kids can't really get out and about, and here I am traveling all over the world and uh, doing these really cool things. And <laughs> most people feel like they can play poker just as well as I can. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's something to try. You know, nobody out there thinks they can play poker as well as Brian Rast or Phil Ivey or Antonio. So but a, a lot of them, a lot of them yeah. think they can play as well as me. I promise you that. <laughs> most of your <laughs> listeners think they can play as well as or better than me. Me. Well, you're wrong, listeners. <laughs> you're all terrible. <laughs> yeah, I got to talk about that, you know, that lavish lifestyle because you're married, but it seems it hasn't slowed down. I saw on your Instagram you were in the booth with Steve Aoki recently. Oh, yeah, yeah. Aoki's a really cool guy. He's, he's, he's a friend of mine as well. And, uh, you know, he, he he's really humble. It, every, things are just going so amazing for him you know he's producing you know grammy tracks all this other stuff and uh Man, that's you know, the but business he, to be in it's <laughs> like, dj i mean yeah. dude i used to own a club in hollywood the appearance and fees are insane i i you do it i would get so upset if i had to pay a dj 300 dollars for a night like a hundred dollars <laughs> was the rate 150 200 for the best dj one of my friends sold me a, hey we got to give uh uh dj am three hundred fifty dollars i'm like come on dude no way <laughs> no and, 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 and and am's like dude my my rate's eight hundred dollars i'm giving you the love rate 350 dj am and by the way he was making 20 grand a night over here a Man. year later you know Man. and uh, it is funny that i used to pay dj am 350 a night and now you know these guys are making two hundred thousand dollars on a night for djing yeah and it's like wait a second so if i could go do it over again maybe i'd be a dj rather than <laughs> you know and that's sort of a promoter yeah that's one of the things that aoki is brilliant about i'm glad you brought him up because aoki you know his father was the benny hana guy you know it, it's uh, he understood marketing and aoki's just such a tremendous marketer mm-hmm. of his brand and of his djing and, uh, you know, I, I, I respect and appreciate that com- with my marketing background, yeah. you know, so I, I love it. I love it. I love the way Kevin Hart markets himself. Yeah, I let's love- talk about the Kevin Hart and The Rock because I saw a picture. You're on the set of Jumanji. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you in Jumanji? No, 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 no. It's, you pop it's, out of the board game? You know, my, 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 my wife's a big fan of uh, the show Ballers on HBO. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, since she knows, obviously, Kevin's doing the movie with him. Yeah. So we asked Kevin, hey, hey, you know, do you think uh, we might be able to meet The Rock? He's like, well, come on over to the set and we'll hang out and, uh, you know. And so it was funny because uh, awesome. when Kevin says to the, to the Rock, he's like, uh, "This is my this is my buddy's wife." No, no, no it's his wife. It's his wife. <laughs> and he, and all, oh, their hands are all up in the air, and it was really <laughs> it was a really cool exchange. And and you know, Dwayne is really really sweet. And yeah, I'm, I I I really am looking forward to that movie. And I'm a fan of both of them, uh, The Rock and and uh, Kevin Hart, and wish them the best. Yeah, like I also saw you went to the Oscars. Were you a seat filler? How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not a seat filler. They just had you a rotating. Seat filler. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't a seat filler. And uh, I did see all the seat fillers, and I was like, you know what? I would have been satisfied to go as a seat filler just to have that yeah. uh, experience, uh, you know, to be at the Oscars. But I was really, really fortunate that, uh, you know, I got full invites with our names and you know, we're right there in the twelfth row. That was like ridiculous. Extra ridiculous was when yeah. people were accepting awards from the seats behind us. <laughs> we're like, wait a second, who am I? What, crazy. what is yeah. going on? Yeah, it was unreal. And, and then you have that ending. Oh yeah, and it, Jimmy Kimmel was unbelievable. And then that ending, like you know, it, that that's going to be the most memorable Oscars of all time, quite yeah. possibly. Yeah. And I was there. You were the, at a sporting event, basically. The, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it's just so crazy how that worked out. You know, I, was I, there I, chaos off camera? 
there, but I, I'm telling you that everybody was so confused. We're like, is this a joke? Are they playing, yeah. making a play on the Steve Harvey thing? And I'm in there, and I mean, I'm telling you, the look of bewilderment. You know, uh, Justin Timberlake was like five seats over from me, mm-hmm. and you're looking at everybody's face is the same. <laughs> and like, what's going on here? Did La La Land win, win Moonlight? What do you mean Moonlight? I mean, who, uh, who even knows what Moonlight is? You know, <laughs> and it's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, and. I, I read mean, somewhere that uh, Matt Damon like noticed it immediately and like told Jimmy because apparently Jimmy Kimmel was supposed to end the show sitting next to Matt Damon as like a joke, right? And instead, Matt Damon immediately noticed that they read the wrong name. I don't know how. Good read, I guess, Matt Damon. And then told Jimmy to get up on stage. Well, and maybe Matt Damon all... knew. Maybe, <laughs> maybe you know. But uh, uh, wow. And and, and you know, for me, it was even more interesting and personally dramatic because. I made a really bad bet with Joe Cassidy. Uh, he, uh, I bet the field against La La Land. Um, what, and I, I laid two to one. I took two to one. I laid the field against Joe Cassidy. And then I... Wait, he took the field then? No, he took La La Land. Oh, wow. So you win. He took La La Land. And then Ivy jumped on there. He's like, I want to get in on this bet. All right, fine. So, you know. And Ivy's like, how much are we going to bet? And so, for, with Ivy, it was my my 10 against his five. And with Cassidy, it was my four against his two. So, you know, I'm risking $14,000. And that was money lit on fire. Yeah. Let me just tell you that when <laughs> they say the... Oscar goes to La La Land. What are the chances of me winning my bet? Right. I, it's got to be a hundred million <laughs> to one. I mean, for that to get reversed, it, if you could see the text exchange needles that I sent to Ivy <laughs> and to Joe Cassidy, I mean, it was over a small bet. Did you but do like the, a weird fist pump oh in the crowd gosh, when they reversed dude. it? It was unbelievable. <laughs> I can just imagine like everyone's confused and John Robert's like doing backflips in the aisle and no one knows why. <laughs> I, 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 I sent them every single meme or whatever, you know, the look of shock on the people's faces. All the Steve Ca- Harvey oh, stuff. Oh man, Cassidy couldn't breathe. <laughs> Oh man, um, yeah. Let's stick with celebrities. What's your What's your favorite encounter so far? Um, favorite encounter, actually. You know what? That That, that Oscars was really cool. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, to be honest with you, my favorite was uh, hanging out with Pharrell for a minute. Okay. He, you know, I, as I'm just a true fan. Like mm-hmm. I, you know, here it is. Here's a guy that you really appreciate. You know the way he deals with people on the voice, and you know I like his energy. Yeah, you're, and, you're a and, fan and, of that and, show. And he's an, such a great artist. Yes, I am. A, I'm a fan of the voice. Yes, and uh, and you know, and he was just really, really, just a sweet, good guy, and like really appreciative of the compliments, and was nice to my wife, and uh, yeah, you know, for all was great, and then, uh, this that uh, Vince Vaughn, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, I think I've, I've played cards with him before. And then uh, Matt Damon, um, you know, he remembered, uh, I, I reminded him when he was shooting, uh, which movie, The Second Born, it was in, he's, he was shooting it in Prague at the time I was living in Prague and running a small poker game Born out there. Supremacy. Yeah, it was it the, was that the second one? No, the Something one was, like that. The third one was The Ultimatum. I liked them all. The Born I, Identity, The Born Supremacy, Supremacy and then Ultimatum. Okay, okay. And then all the terrible ones that followed it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, um, yeah, I, I, I got, had a quick exchange with him over there at the Oscars. And yeah, that, that, that event was really surprising to me because it was a bucket list thing that I knew I just had to chalk off and then mm-hmm. done for life. And I'm, I'm probably never going to go back to an Oscars You'll never again. top it. Yeah, and I went there and fully enjoyed it. I thought it was going to be a bunch of political speeches, you know, mm-hmm bashing Trump and doing whatever. And I was like, this is going to be annoying. But it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. It moved right along. And Jimmy Kimmel, like, I've always thought Jimmy Kimmel's pretty good and funny, but he was exceptional. You know, that's a lot of pressure to come through prime time like that. It's a no-win situation when you host the Oscars. It seems like it. Yeah. 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 So you brought it up, reality TV. You uh, watch a lot these days? I don't. I don't watch any reality TV. Not even Survivor, then? No, no, I haven't watched it in years. Um, that being said, I did get a call from uh, from Lynn Spillman not too long ago. She was just wanted kind of like a little update on uh, one of the poker players that's trying to do one of her shows, maybe oh, okay. a Survivor. Uh, she's in charge of all uh, casting for Mark Burnett, and she's the one who oh, okay. casted me on uh, Survivor CBS. before. Yeah, she's with CBS. And we were talking about the new shows and everything, and uh, it was nice catching up with her. Yeah. yeah. Okay, besides yourself, who had the best reality TV performance of the poker world? You got, like, 
Maria. You got David Williams last year. Vanessa on Big Brother. Who's the winner? Oh, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I, I don't watch a lot of that shit. <laughs> I will tell you that I fully, fully enjoyed the MasterChef season with uh, David mm-hmm. Williams. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> Him throwing that tantrum. I mean, he picked up a champagne bottle and threw it. I couldn't believe it. And it's like he's and, and he's talking back to the chef. I mean, I, what, what in the world? Is like, yes. I mean, he can da- get away with it. David was fantastic. I mean, what are the chances that he quit the show? And uh, what's his name? The chef, uh, chef. Uh, uh, Oh my goodness, Ramsey! Yeah, Gordon actually Ramsey. walked walked outside and said, "David, are you, you know?" Yeah. I, I, you, there's no chance that Gordon Ramsey has ever gone outside to ask a chef to come back to work like yeah. that. I mean, it was it, that was the most unreal thing. David actually <laughs> left the set. He picked up his apron, threw it down, quit, left play. the set, and then Gordon Ramsey got him back on. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to get David on to talk about that. Um, love David. Love David Williams. Okay, you talked about your bad beats. But can you remember the worst bad beat you put on someone else? Um, I can. I can. I, uh, it was actually very recently. Um, I'm going to say it's like two and a half months ago was Dr. Fred Heckmutt. He's an uh, uh, orthopedic surgeon out of mm-hmm. uh, L.A. And I was playing with him, and uh, there were a series of raises pre-flop, and I had uh, two queens. Okay. And um, it came ace rag rag, and uh, no, it came king rag rag, and I've got the two queens, and he just jams all in. Uh, he was super steamed. Mm-hmm. He was already in like a couple bullets, and he jams like a hundred thousand into a forty thousand dollar pot uh, on a king like a king do six board. Yeah, and I had two queens, and I just like I just did not believe he had ace king or or better yeah and i called him with the two queens and uh he had indeed ace king (laughs) and uh we ran it two boards and i hit the queen on both boards oh (laughs) yeah i thought you were gonna say i sucked out for half yeah yeah yeah, no 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 got both no i hit the i hit the two case queens on both boards and I mean, he it's extra brutal because he bet double the pot. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he was just like, this pot is mine. He bet double the pot. I called him and I hit the queen both ports. Yep. That's brutal. How did he react, he react to it? Oh. <laughs> Immediately get up and walk. Like, he, he, no, no. He, he did remind me of it when I saw him in L.A. at, uh, at the LAPC recently. But uh, he's, he's a great guy also and such a pleasure to play with. Another guy who's fun to play with. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about the toughest time of your career? Um, to be honest with you, tough times, they, they, they're, they're, they're just a part of uh, living poker. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't even tell you the guys that I have the most respect for in poker. I, they, go through, they go through tough, tough, you know, brutal times where it's like you want to cry. You can't believe it. Just when it can't get any worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a perfect example is, is uh, Brian Rast. Last year, there, there was a time of about six months. This guy couldn't win a pot for anything. Yeah. I mean, I just watched him just get tortured, 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 tortured. And then all of a sudden, you know, then he has a huge score and wins the, uh, what was that? The, uh, he won the 50K. He won the bike bet. Uh, yeah, he yeah. was on. He was on. Yeah, the and, 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 and yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. That's when the bike bet was when everything bike started bet turning to get around. Even <laughs> yeah, on the year or, he, or something. He won, like that. and he won the uh, the poker, the super high roller bowl yeah. last year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, this guy's. Like I say, he's a tremendous poker player, mm-hmm. and even he went through. And I, I actually got to the point. Like you never ever think that you're ever going to actually feel sorry or feel bad <laughs> for Brian Rast, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about yeah. running bad. Yeah. Um, best uh, gambling degen story, but outside of cards. Hmm. Gambling degen story. Outside I mean, you got to bet on things outside of. I don't know if you're a pit guy or anything oh, yeah, like that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Sports bets, big sports bets, or uh, well, crazy mm-hmm. prop bets. Yeah, you kind of put me on the spot. I can't think of anything offhand. I know Bill Perkins and Dan Bilzerian always come up with some crazy. Uh, big absurd prop bets but uh yeah all right we skipped that one what's uh who's the best poker player that we've never heard of Mm. because like i mean the cast of characters you play with some of them are unknowns to uh poker media 
Yeah. Best poker player that you guys have never heard of. Or somebody who's just underrated. Mm. Besides yourself. <laughs> well, I don't know that I'm underrated. I, 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 I don't know that I'm you underrated. You just said at all. All, all of my audience thinks they can beat you. Yeah, that doesn't mean that, that doesn't mean that they're, they're, they're wrong. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they're wrong. Yeah. And I'm not trying to sell myself short or anything, but I, I have come to recognize that you know there, there are players that are like outstanding, and uh, the best chance you have at poker is trying to play with people that aren't as good as you, mm-hmm. or uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's the best shot. Especially, you got to fade the rake and all this other stuff. So, uh, yeah, um, underrated players. You know, I, I, that those are two questions. The two questions you had, like, if I had like four hours to think about each of those, I'd probably come up with brilliant answers. <laughs> and uh, you know, right now, I'm not not coming up with somebody. No, you for should you. do. Call me. Leave a voicemail. We'll just copy and paste it into okay. this part of the podcast. Okay. <laughs> and if not, then John O'Bear never called me back. So there you have it, listeners. <laughs> uh, you've uh, come close to a bracelet twice, mm-hmm. uh, most notably in the 50K Poker Players Championship. Uh, is that something you really want? Because I haven't been seeing a lot of tournament scores lately. You know, Are you uh, retired from tournament poker? One, no, no, I'm not retired from tournament poker. But uh, but I, I, I don't play a lot of tournaments. And that's why that 50K tournament was like particularly exciting. And getting that close, got that second place, and you know uh, Bobby Baldwin uh, needles me. He offered to put a silver bracelet for me in the trophy case at Aria <laughs> just to <laughs> acknowledge my second place nice finish. Cool. They should oh give my second goodness. and third place. It's bracelets. so brutal. It's so brutal. He said he's gonna put together a silver bracelet for me. I like that idea. A silver <laughs> bracelet for second. We get a bronze for third, oh, and then everyone who bought in gets a participation ribbon. <laughs> uh but yeah what do you what's your plan for the summer are you gonna play a full schedule or? um i i'm you know i i'm hope to get in like six or seven events um probably gonna play the main event uh i'm interested in playing the 50k event but the 50k event from two years ago included badoogie and nola Meduse. this year they didn't include those events oh, wow. and because those are two of my best games you know i'm much more interested in playing it if those are in there. Plus, I think, you know, the all-around championship should include as many games as possible. Yeah. I mean, that's the way it should be. So, if, if they put those two games back into that mix, I'll be in it. But uh, with, with them out, I, I don't really want to play. I've seen you uh, occasionally wear headphones at the table. Uh, what are you normally listening to? Um, yeah, you know, I'm a, I, I'm a pop music guy. Really? It's crazy because, you know, when I was a kid... All my friends were listening to Rush and U2, and I was over there listening to <laughs> Ready for the World, Michael Jackson, George Michael, and uh, you know peace. it's interesting because last week I, here I am back at uh, at uh, Bruno Mars, and Bruno Mars put on a heck of a show right next door. I just I enjoy the pop stuff. That's it, you know. I'm a I'm a I'm a pop music guy. My wife and I have a weird thing with Bruno Mars because in two of his songs he says Julio. Oh wow! And and we're trying to figure out who this Julio character is in uh, Bruno Mars's life because in one song he says Julio get the stretch, and in this new song he says Julio serve that scampi. So it's it's like a limo driver or a servant of some kind. Looks and like it. May, may, he's like a guy. He's like his right hand guy. It's just weird to hear my name in song. Yeah, it's, it's probably his right hand. Name. It's probably it's probably his buddy. His, his right hand. <laughs> I gotta figure that mystery out. Um, I know you, you said you were a nightclub promoter. What was the worst job you had before poker? And what would you be doing if not for poker? Did the you have any worst weird job. jobs growing up? Well, I had some. You ever flip burgers? I, you know, I, 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 you know, at 12 years old, I was, uh, I was putting, assembling computers in Taiwan and selling. It was at fake Apple II uh, computers and Are selling you- them. You say you worked at twelve a and thirteen. <laughs> it wasn't a sweatshop, but yeah, I guess so. I mean, and it's funny because they wanted an American to be on the phone doing their cold calling form because to give them credibility. And uh, so I would call up the different random businesses, and they'd as be a like, "Twelve year old." As as a twelve year old, <laughs> and they'd say, and, and, and it's a uh, uh, Miss Miss Bobby on the phone, Miss Bobby. Uh, well, no, not Miss, just Mister. <laughs> and you know, my voice is super high at the time, and. 
I mean, what in the world? <laughs> You're mistaken for a girl. Oh, yeah, yeah. Miss so, Bobby. Yeah, that was. What yeah, what world? do you prefer, Bobby or Jean Robert? Well, obviously, my name's Jean Robert. As a kid, I went by Bobby for uh, short, you know, because uh, uh, it's hard for kids to say Jean Robert. But uh, you know, obviously, we prefer my real name. <laughs> uh, we always end the podcast with the a random uh, conversation uh, starter question from a website generator. Uh, so this one you got is, what is one of your favorite words or phrases? Uh, uh, I'm sure de your vivre. wife could probably answer this Joie better. de vivre. Joie, Joie de, de vivre. vivre. It's like a French word, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like, uh, it's kind of a joy that permeates from someone. Uh, and that's, that was the best way to describe to somebody when I met my wife and how much you know, she just had to have this, this joie de vivre and you just drawn to that energy. That's right. You're fluent in uh, French. I'm not fluent in French, but French is my first language. Oh, okay. Uh, I learned French before I learned English. And then uh, when I learned Mandarin, then I forgot a lot of the French, but I still understand. It's interesting <laughs> because my wife's Mexican, but she f speaks French. I don't speak French anymore because she <laughs> speaks French. Uh, I'm going to give you one more because this one was just fun. Would you rather be homeless for a year or be in jail for a year? I'd rather be homeless for a year. 100%. Homeless, at least you can, like, uh, go places and uh, discover things. You know, you don't I guess it depends you, on what part of the world you're in, though. I you know, for me, for sure. Homeless, because uh, I've always been able to, like, just make things happen with or without money. You know, just, mm -hmm. yeah, no. You'll find a way. Dude, I, I might just make it everywhere around the world. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because the you know I was on Survivor, but probably the better show for me would have been that uh, what's the show where they like travel around and the Amazing Race. Amazing Race. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, that would have been a great show for me. Yeah, yeah that was when Maria Ho was on. Yeah, with uh, Tiffany Michelle. I might still do that show. That's a, uh, that that's a fun show. I was always really drawn to that show. <laughs> and with that, we end the podcast. Thank you. Thanks, Julio. That's it. That's the show. Thanks once again to Jean Robert Balland. You can follow his crazy life on Twitter at BrokeLivingJRB or even check out his website, JRBPoker.com. I think he's got some t shirts there for sale. Don't forget to rate, review, subscribe, and let us know at PokerStories at CardPlayer.com to win a free subscription. See you next time. <laughs>